Let's go, baby. Why are you talking to us about the recording in progress? Um, all right. Well, apparently I have a new update in my computer and I did not turn off the audio function. So it's going to, you know, the hearing impaired function or visually impaired. I'm not sure which one it is. But uh, yeah. So fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we got, a, we got a pretty interesting show ahead of you guys. So um yeah, Josh was going to take us down cryptocurrency lane and a little bit more speculation or at least some insights on what might be going on uh, with our um, another one of the world superpowers that actually has a lot of sway and a lot of things. Um, we're also going to get into the PACE program, which is a government uh, structured program or uh, yeah, it's a it's a government structured program, I believe. I, I've got more details on the other side, uh, but what the program is, is to help people that say, if you wanted to buy, like your air conditioner goes out or you want to get solar panels on your home, that kind of stuff. And I'm sure everybody has seen this stuff recently where people are saying, hey, get solar at no cost. Yeah, you're going to want to watch this episode. Oh, uh, all right. And uh, then we have the mainstream media narrative and how they vet. So uh, whatever the events are and how they're actually going to put it out there. So we're going to talk a little bit about all that. So now that I've got the man that only Prince would sing about, Joshua on the other side of the screen that you all on Facebook World Live, you can't see him. You can't unless you go to our channel, Waking the People on YouTube and Rumble. Subscribe. And you take that like button out to a nice little tender dinner. You get it a seafood dinner. And you take that like button down to pound town. There you go. And don't forget to subscribe. Come back to us. I know you won't to the tender date because you're a savage. But with that, let's get into it. I like it. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, we're going to talk about Bitcoin mining here pretty soon. For the show, for all of our Facebook listeners, uh, if, if you're on the Facebook side and you haven't ventured over to our, our YouTube channel, our Rumber channel, uh, you really don't know what I look like. So I'm, it sounds narcissistic, but I, I could be that little, whenever you watch our channel, you mine, you get to see me. So welcome back to another episode of Waking the People. Uh, great to be here. Wednesday, beer episode, at least for myself. Got the bottle yeah. rolling. Chad. I got a three-day coin of sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> you can't ruin it. So it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a interesting week as always. Uh, so much to talk about, so much going on, uh, not just only in our country, but around the world, especially with things that are starting to be more hot topics than they were beforehand. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a big topic, Chad. We might as well just go ahead and jump into it. I've already mentioned Get into it, baby. I'm, I'm, Get I'm into it. Mining. So Get the lube out. Let's go in. We had a little bit of a rebound, especially today, if you're in the crypto space. A little bit of a jump up. Now, this kind of reiterates at least my opinion on what I think is going on. Again, Chad and I are not financial advisors. This is all for entertainment purposes only. But I think there's a, a lot of manipulation and a lot of side action going on with, with crypto. And it all started with China coming out and saying that they were going to ban Bitcoin and yeah. cryptocurrencies. And we discussed this in the last episode, but not too much into real depth. But this is not the first time that China has banned crypto and, and, and Bitcoin. This is actually the third, multiple times that this has happened. And Chad, it's, it's interesting. So I'll, I don't want to give away the whole thing because this, this is going to be a big topic. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump in just a little snippet. And I'm going to throw it over to Chad. So I, went, a, I want to give do, a do, do what? You want to give it just the tip? Just the tip. Just the tip. All right. Just what we're gonna do. So I went to go research. Oh, you know, I was familiar with previous experiences with China and, and cryptocurrency. <clears throat> I said I wanted to type in um, China banning Bitcoin. Is what I typed in, and so I got CoinDesk, which is the first article that I read on the matter. CoinDesk, which is a cryptocurrency website that gives you news, charts, the whole nine. It's a very pro crypto. I got. Uh, I believe the title was. Uh, China bans cryptoid again. Bobby Lee, who is a, he owns a, a Bitcoin uh, company. Bobby Lee says, good for crypto. Okay, so this is a, 
a crypto news database saying, good thing, uh, not the first time. Right next to it, Chad, I got CNN, China banning cryptocurrencies. Then I got like NBC, is this the end of cryptocurrency question mark? Uh, it's so this, not to jump off on a media tangent so much, but- Oh, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> ah, man, if, if, if this shows you that this is, they're just not going after politics. They are, they misconstrued information, Chad, to a, an unbelievable level. It bleeds, it leads, baby. You get people's attention, put them in a fear state, they're likely going to check in because they want to try to protect themselves or protect their investment. Yep, this is going to be a perfect tie-in later on. Uh, it's going to be about how the media will vet the topics that they're going to publish based off of the narrative they continue to push and how they're going to slant the story or abandon the story. So, yeah, we're going to get into a little bit of that later. So, yeah, this is it's insane to see like how an entire country tries to manipulate something because to me, that's what I see whenever it comes to crypto over in China. Now, why are they doing it? Is it that they want to control their their monetary values and keep it inside of their system that they can control? Or is it that they want to try to do a short squeeze by doing it from a, a, a country's level versus a small company or a company on the stock market or, you know, these, uh, or these, um, stock brokers. Yeah. It's, it's so, so what they did is they, they, they're starting to crack down on mining. They didn't ban it all outright, but they're going to. And the thing about the Chinese government is they do things very calculated. They don't do it all at once. When you say ban done, it's, it's kind of, it has a weird reaction. They slowly, start to like work their way in and cut things off. And to be honest with you, in 2013, they banned uh, Bitcoin as a, a, a transaction medium. A, a lot of that has to do with the fact that China does not like to have their currency exchanged for other currencies. And Bitcoin uh, really opened the door for that. So they banned it as a transaction medium, not it, it all together. And again, they like to misconstrue that to make you think it's banned in general when it's not. So now they're going to crack down on mining. And if they uh, most of the mining for Bitcoin, uh, if you don't know what mining is, hit up the channel and, and Chad and I will talk to you. It, it's, a, it's a long process. But if, if a lot of the mining for Bitcoin is in China. And if China, Chad, were to ban it all outright, it would not hurt Bitcoin. Actually, the only thing that it would hurt would be the Chinese government because all those people are going to do that mine is go to Switzerland, come to the United States. And then you're going to see a changing of the guard as far as who, which country holds the majority of Bitcoin. And so, hey, China, ban away, baby. Do what you want to do. It'll go down. It'll it'll crash. But guess what? It'll rebound right back up again. So what do you think, Chad? Yeah, dude, it's, well, that's also something. It's like the, the terms used. Don't let the term catch you up. It screwed me up for a while. When people are like, oh, it's, it's, it's you know, they're crypto mining and, it's not literally digging into the earth. It's not looking for um, that type of, it's not trying to pull ore out of the earth. It, it's a different thing. So like Joshua said, go over to the show. Uh, actually, we talked a bit about this on a previous episode and we can go further into it on another episode, but today we're not slated for that as much. We just wanted to kind of talk about it overall in general. So yeah, as far as that goes, it's, it's a really interesting process. And I will say that, if you want to know more about it, it's time to start learning because as back in the day, it was, a, it was something that was said for the coal miners is, and it, it was intended to be, I don't know, necessarily fully intended to be an insult, but it wasn't exactly caring to these individuals that were lifelong coal miners learn to code. Now, I would say that it's coming from certain people as a pompous statement, but what it, really the best thing about it is you want to transcend your skill sets into something else and, and also continue to pour, uh, to open up your portfolio and diversify into other things, not just your investments, but also your skill sets. So learn, don't be the last person to the table when everybody else has already got everything that they wanted and you may find scraps, if anything, or beg for something. Uh, don't put yourself in that situation. Continue to learn is my suggestion. So if they move out of China, China, um, even better. 
you know, like send them over this direction. Uh, I would say that they may not choose the United States right away. As from what I understand about this, it also does take a bit of uh, digital um, resources in order to produce uh, the, the products they're looking for, which the products we're looking for is source code, right? They're just trying yeah. to make sure they yeah. continuously make it a stronger code. Yeah, and, and also energy output. So like China does have a lot of in, like energy producing infrastructures. And that is part of the reason why a lot of people chose to mine in China originally. But um, as time goes on, there's a lot of countries that would jump on board that have very powerful infrastructures. Uh, I feel like, I don't know, what do you think, Chad? Our infrastructure is like, okay, I think it could be better. But um, It could be better, but it's not bad. What no, I, would, the not bad. I would say they may avoid the United States. I don't know what their operating costs would be if they were on our shores. So yeah. it's, you have to look at the, the economy and the, the country that they're in. If they're conducting business there, they're likely going to have to pay some sort of, it, the resources are going to cost something and they're likely going to have to pay taxes on something that they're doing if there's some sort of, you know, commerce taking place. So I would say they may look for something that has a, a sustainable infrastructure um, or a consistent one and then find some place that's just cheaper to be residents of while they do what they're doing. So, but this chat, since you're saying that, I heard uh, that what they're going to do possibly in the United States is if you can prove that you can mine Bitcoin and uh, have it have like a carbon free emission, so good for the environment, pro green, that you actually get to have a tax write off too. Interesting. Sneaky, right? Yeah. Sneaky. Yeah. It, hey, I'm, I'm curious to see everything that's going on with this current administration and how they're going to incentivize certain industries and de-incentivize uh, de or dis, I'm sorry, learning to speak today, uh, disincentivize others. So like one thing that uh, Beto O'Rourke, that loudmouth bastard, um, what he has to say since he's now the, uh, he's the, uh, the person that's over the DOT uh, is he wants to, now there's more details necessary and they haven't published all the details just yet of what the proposition is. But they want to they want to create a mileage tax, not a mileage tax break or tax credit, but a tax on the mileage that you drive. And this is for electric car uh, uh, electric vehicles since they don't use gas, and gas is where they get their tax money to repair roads and things like that. So it's a tax on your gas, and it makes sense because if you're going to fill up, you're likely going to spend that gas driving around, therefore creating more wear on the on the roads. And that's how they would create their tax revenue for that. They're proposing a mileage tax, but I have not seen enough, uh, I haven't seen enough of the data about what they're really proposing because it's still a proposition. But if it goes through at the level of clarity they currently offered, it could end up being a double tax for people that drive combustion engines. They'd get taxed for their mileage and they'd get taxed for their gasoline, which is a double tax for the same purpose. I don't know if it's going to end up coming to that. I have not seen a finalized draft uh, or a draft before finalizing uh, or even a final product overall of what their plan is with this particular tax proposal. So uh, I don't know, but bringing that back over to the you know, uh, zero emissions direction, it is interesting if they can prove that they can do a zero emissions and then they get you know, tax incentives in order to do their business here, it obviously would encourage these people to come to the United States to do business. So the issue that I find with it though, is that this is one that it's a global product. It's, but it also isn't a global product the United States would actually have any kind of ownership over. It's true. Because it's whoever's doing that is just mining it for, you know, it's, they're, it's all self-contained for themselves and they could sell the product off to someplace else uh, or however that works. I'm, I'm an idiot in this, but it's not a tangible product that you can say, hey, here you go. You've got, you know, 14 units of whatever the product is that I've worked on. And, you know, here it is to sell. There's the commerce that's taking place, the exchange of money, and then the taxes are associated with it. That may not necessarily be something that helps our economy overall by them coming to the United States to do the work here. I just don't know what that's going to create. That's an interesting proposition, but is it even going to be beneficial? Because these people, as far as I understand, they can work anywhere in the world. 
it doesn't make a difference. It's not like they need the land for a resource. They just need the infrastructure. They need the you know power consistency, uh, access to the internet consistently, that kind of thing. You know, servers. But yeah, that's I don't know. I said that's not my area of expertise. I'm I'm a child learning this, if you will. Um, so, but I plan to dig in deeper. So, Joshua, do you have any any perspectives on that? I like it. Uh, it. It makes sense too, because the coolest thing about Bitcoin is that you don't need permission to buy it. So, no matter who you are, you could be the United States government, you could be, you know, your neighbor, you could be any anyone has permission to buy Bitcoin. So I agree with the fact that having more miners in the United States would would allow more people in the United States to hold more Bitcoin, but doesn't necessarily mean that the United States government or we have more Bitcoin. It just is in the I guess it's in our country more. Which it's, uh, it's the only thing I would see, the only tax values that I would see that actually would go back to the economy. Because the, if you want an incentive to bring somebody over and you're going to give them a tax value credit or something like that uh, to get them here, it's because them doing business here helps our economy. The only thing I can see is the power consumption, the Ethernet or the, the access to the Internet, you know, and the servers that they may be running off of if they're based in the United States or they're using something that's based in the United States. I could see that being a way of being at least contributing somewhat to the economy, but their goods and their transaction of goods beyond resource requirements really wouldn't have much of an economic value to us. Yeah. I mean, you no, know, unless there's something built in, but I don't know how they would do that. And that would be an interesting thing to say. What about capital gains tax? You think since you're cashing it out into American dollars, I would presume you would have to pay capital gains tax on it. So I guess we would get some, we would get some tax benefits as a country because of that. But yeah, I agree. It's kind of tricky. And it really makes you think. We, we talked about it at the beginning of this segment about how. So crypto is crypto was originally made for the sole purpose of decentralization, and the the world or the the people who run the world really are not a big fan of that. And it's funny how we have a a crypto news network publishing positives about this, and every mainstream media including in the United States and in China, interesting, interesting correlation, are uh, completely, completely against it, right? They, 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 they don't even want anyone to take part in it that is a mainstream media news watcher. So yeah, it makes you think, Chad, who's, so we have the decentralized crypto people, you know, hodl it up, and now we have mainstream media saying, it's a pyramid scam. Uh, China's going to ban it. It's bad for the environment. It's it's funny, man. Yeah, and on my point is like if it's a, if China's going to ban it, and there what that means they're just not to accept anybody making payments or exchanging for goods with crypto. There, who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. You don't buy Chinese products straight from China. You buy them from places like. Walmart and, and other stores that carry it or Amazon or wherever you buy it from, but you don't make that transaction with China. So who gives a shit if they ban it? You know what? That's just less people consuming it on the stockholder side, or if you shareholder or if you own coin or the cryptocurrency itself, you, the value would go up if they help, they own it. Obviously there's more demand for a limited amount of supply, uh, but you know, or a restricted amount of supply. I can see that making a difference there, but other than that, who gives a shit? You know, if you're planning on getting rich quick and you got those paper hands, thank you, Joshua. Mm -hmm. uh, you got those paper hands, yeah, and you're going to buy in late in the game, and you're hoping that the the Bitcoin hits a million dollars a coin. Yeah, you think you're going to buy in at forty thousand, or are you forty five thousand, or even up to where it was, you know, almost seventy thousand? You know. If you think you're going to get in and then make it to a million, yeah, you're going to be one of the people that are, you know, you're losing money in the game because you're just not going to get that right away anyway. So, you know, it's if you're paper hands, you're wanting to do quick transactions, you know, or you get those lettuce hands. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, got that's tested such a we got tested. It was a good little bounce back today. Very good yeah. little bounce back. All the ones we've talked about did pretty well. 
uh, you know, still trucking along with Cardano. It's still my baby. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's good stuff, Jen. I like oh, it. man. Yeah. So could they be doing something as far as China goes and, and intentionally kind of stoking the fire or creating fear and concern? They could, you know, but ultimately I, I don't really see a whole lot of value in putting too much emphasis on what they're doing specifically with the cryptocurrency for the time being. Uh, it's more about looking at the validity and, and usage around the world, not necessarily just focusing on what China is trying to say or offer. So, all uh, right. Let's see. So uh, I don't have a whole lot else to say about crypto at the moment. Oh, uh, it's just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you got more on it? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do one thing. I had someone ask me the other day uh, of a book, a crypto book that I like. So I, I, I got the book cover. Uh, I'm not getting any money for this. This is just a book that I actually enjoyed. So it's called Crypto Assets. Crypto this is what Assets. the cover looks like. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, not necessarily, it, it does have a lot of financial investment tips in there, but it more so gives you a complete beginning to end backstory on every single, at least major crypto, non, you know, shit coin that are popping up all over the place. It gives you a very, very good backstory and some really, really detailed information. So I highly recommend it. Yeah. Hey, it's always good to educate yourself and don't just take it from talking heads. It is good to find publications as well that you know, it can get vetted more than a video, not to discredit ourselves, but I'm growing a, a deeper dis, a appreciation for cryptocurrency. Um, but I'm not a fanboy necessarily. I just think it's entertaining. Uh, but on the other side of it, Joshua is definitely far more into it and he spends more time learning, which is helping me learn because he's my tutor in this and or my, you could call my crypto mentor. So, since, since, yeah. Oh, but let's tie it. Let's tie in the media thing then. So since the media likes to play a lot, and if anybody's noticed, predominantly the mainstream media is made up mostly of left and or Democrat uh, organizations and or publications. Um, you know, things as simple as, you know, the New York Times refusing to call you know, President Trump, President Trump, they call him Mr. Trump. Um, this a that's a subtle thing, but it actually does show a bias and a prejudice against him, where they still call other ex-presidents by the president title, because it is the last position that they held. Now, um, mainstream media does have a habit of doing this. Doesn't mean that the things that you find in alternative, uh, alternative news sources and or media like Joshua and myself, to some degree, it doesn't mean that they don't hear about the other things. It just means they don't find that it fits the narrative. And the narrative is what they've been pushing. Now, Fox has its own narrative because it's the only mainstream kind of more Republican uh, of them. Uh, but I'm not even the biggest fan of Fox, although I do like some of the people on it. I just, I don't take anything um, hook, line and sinker or anything. I, I'm um, critical about everything that I see when it comes to mainstream media, no matter which station it is. But what they do for vetting is they put it against the narrative. They'll look and see exactly what, Let's say they want to keep the Black Lives Matter narrative continuing uh, and that, you know, white supremacy is the issue. You can have black on black crime. Like last weekend, we had over 35 people shot in a single setting, one mass shooting in Chicago uh, at a house party and nobody touched it in the news, maybe local news, but we did not get it in mainstream news because it wasn't a police officer or even for their narrative, uh, a white police officer that did it. So it had nothing to do with that. Therefore, it didn't hit the news. Now we get people like uh, Lori Lightfoot, which is the mayor of Chicago, and she continues to push her own narrative, uh, which fits into the mainstream narrative that it's no uh, anybody who's involved in this type of stuff is completely admonished or admonished. Sorry, admonished of of having any uh, culpability or responsibility that they're not at fault. It's somebody else's fault, and it keeps pushing that narrative. Drawback to that is that power that you have as an individual will stem from your responsibility. How responsible are you? And that's that's how powerful you are. Uh, if you want to make change in your life, you have to start with being responsible. Mainstream media pushes that away and says somebody else is responsible. They vet these narratives against that type of that that, that, that kind of soundboard, the sounding board, if you will. So you get things like this. If 
we do not, if they say, they, we'll say the establishment for, you know, all other purposes, we'll just say that's who it is. They don't want something to happen. Whomever this is, this, this behind the curtain uh, group of individuals, however big that individual group is, I don't know. Uh, but I would say that it looks like it's fairly large given how many different states and how many different people and organizations seem to be involved with it. Now, if it doesn't fit that narrative, it's not going to come on. It's not going to be put out on the news. I want to point at something and use this as kind of an example of what I'm talking about and how there's a control mechanism built into this, especially to keep people in line. So do you recall about a month, about actually two months ago, maybe a month and a half, two months, um, uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, it hit mainstream news sources. Now for people that, like for myself, Joshua, uh, people that are on the Republican side, other non-party affiliates, and even centric lefts, uh, uh, centric uh, Democrats and or left um, uh, liberals that are more centric. We've all been saying something happened in the nursing homes. There's been reports. We're asking about what's happening, what, what happened with COVID in the nursing homes. And we've all been saying it for so long and nobody was doing anything about it. It wasn't showing up on the news. Uh, we heard about, we didn't hear anything about, and even in our, our research areas, we didn't really hear of any investigations going on. And then all of a sudden, out of damn near nowhere, you know, all of a sudden it hits the news, which is, you know, could Andrew Cuomo have, you know, ties or responsibility with people dying in nursing homes? Is the number higher, you know, and like all this went on for about a week and then it transitioned over to the sexual allegations that went on for about two weeks, maybe uh, possibly three, just didn't go on that long. But with the way that I viewed it was this, is Andrew, or Mr. Cuomo or Governor Cuomo likely didn't f listen to what he was being instructed to do and didn't really think that there was going to be consequences, maybe got full of himself. I don't know. It's all speculation. I'm looking at the pattern of how something just happened and then it disappeared. So he probably pushed back a little bit. And I'm saying all this in a hypothetical because I don't know, I have no nothing to back this other than just seeing a pattern that emerged and then it kind of just went away. Uh, but also his behavior shifted as well. If you watch some of his actions around that time, if he stepped out of line, they could have said easily, well, you don't want to get out of line and let me show you why. And then all of a sudden, now he's possibly going to face if they investigate that and find out that he was liable and responsible for Nana not making it out of the nursing home during the COOF outbreak, uh, pandemic thing, whatever, um, and because she didn't make it out and all of these other people, which is over 12,000 people, they're saying it could be actually 45% more than that. Uh, that's insane. What would happen to somebody if they were directly proven to be responsible for the death of up to you know, almost 7, 000, or 17,000 people? Now, actually, I'm sorry, it would be over 17,000 people if it was over 40% more, if it could be that. What, what would happen to that person? They likely would be, they'd be put away for life. Because uh, I don't believe New York City has the death penalty, but I don't think they would commit, they would commit somebody the death penalty for that. Um, but because of the way it worked, it wasn't first degree, no. but anyway. Um, so then comes the sexual allegations. And the news cycle buries the Nana in the nursing home. And now they're focusing on sexual allegation issues and or misconduct allegations. Um, so now you've got multiple women coming forward saying, yeah, he, you know, he was bad. He behaved poorly. He did these things that were, you know, that were harassment or, or sexual aggressive advances, things like that. Now they're showing him, we'll get you in multiple places. And then it just kind of starts drifting out. You know, his brother, Chris, is like puts out on, you know, obviously on CNN, says, well, I'm a man of integrity. Just watch. I, I will always speak the truth. I will never work and, and coerce. And I will be a man for justice. And then it's found out that he was also advising his brother's uh, PR campaign and in, in, um, PR, uh, his, his representatives that were trying to handle the sexual allegations, trying to, uh, he was giving them advice on how to handle these allegations. That's not a person for justice. That's a person for nepotism. 
So with that, it's a lot of that stuff is just something to say, what the hell is going on here? Would that be the left or the establishment, if you will, putting the squeeze on him so that he gets to acting right again and behaves how they want him to behave, do what they want him to do? It, it just seemed kind of, it, it was really interesting what was going on at that time. Again, his behavior changed and it came out of nowhere in the news cycle, then it just went away. Now, some of the allegations are still coming up occasionally for the sexual allegations, but for the most part, that's gone too. Said so that we've got that much stuff going on. We don't want to follow up on somebody that may have killed, you know, 19,000 people. So, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, the numbers are off. I'm not doing the math right now. So it's just, what can we look and, and pull out of that? If you think that nobody's behind the, the scenes pulling the strings, uh, and you think a lot of this stuff is happening by just individual interests and, you know, almost like a chaotic turning of the wheel. It's not going to be like that necessarily. You can see a lot of things. Once you hear one thing, it turns into something else later on down the road. So it's there's a process to it. You know, a lot of this stuff. And then again, there will be just genuine accidents that occur. Uh, and what I'm saying all that about is because it's, to me, there's got to be somebody else. There's more people involved in it than what you see on the surface. So. With that, uh, my example may be a little long-winded, <laughs> but point of this, they use a narrative to sound anything they put on the, uh, the news, and it, they've got to adjust it to fit the narrative or it doesn't get reported. Well, and, and from the way I see it, it this isn't just a news thing. It, it, it should, this isn't really a tangent. It, it's, it's correlated, but... I found, and we've talked about this, we've talked about this in the show before, about the predominance in our society of, of gaslighting. Now, this is it's starting to become a real problem. I had uh, I went home to Atlanta this weekend, and I had a conversation with my first mentor ever, Chad. Uh, probably he met me when I was 15 years old, and 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 we've known each other for a very long time. It's the first conversation we've had probably like eight years, and we talked for. We talked for 45 minutes in the doorway. So we had a long conversation. And at the very end of it, all I remember saying was that was a great conversation. And I'm, I'm, I'm tying this back into the media is almost just mainlining the go ahead to gaslight. And if you're not really familiar with what gaslighting is, it's when you... Whenever you have any kind of conversation, any kind of narrative you're pitching, any kind of any kind of coercion with, with people, and you maybe don't necessarily agree, you don't know how to respond, and you respond in a manner to where you make that individual question their own sanity and their own viewpoint, just solely based on emotion. And the media has done this so much, Chad, that my eyes have been really starting to open about the, the, the pandemic that is gaslighting. And it, it, it spawns into so many different things. And, and the media is just continuing to drive this horse as far as, you know, what, what stories are pitched, what aren't, how they pitch them how, it, for a particular story. Are we going to trigger emotion? Are we going to make you be impulsive? They're, they're just, they're gaslighting to the extreme to the extreme to where now in our society, that's how most people interact with one another. Yeah, well, it's, it's constant. It, gaslighting disables a person's faculties from understanding reality. And it makes an individual more dependent on whoever's telling them reality is, instead of being able to use their own faculties to see that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an attempt, it's actually one of the things that's used in psychology, they, there's a narcissistic tool, uh, the narcissist tool, uh, shit, toolkit, and gaslighting is one of those things that's on it. Uh, with that, it is a way of creating control over another person so that they're less likely to get away from you. So like a narcissist may want to isolate an individual or a victim uh, so that they are not able to find rational understanding of what they're going through. They isolate them from their family and friends so that they aren't capable of realizing what reality is. 
and the victim therefore becomes submissive to them, which is one of the goals that a lot of our narcissists have. Uh, they want people to be more submissive to them on average. Now, there's other reasons why they do it as well, but that's one of the reasons why they use gaslighting for that. Gaslighting actually, by its term, came up from an early movie back in the, I believe it was the 1940s. Uh, it might have been the 1950s. And the movie was actually called Gaslighting. Uh, but it, the process of it had to do with a gas light and an old pilot, or it, it's a pilot light and a, a gas stove. Uh, but anyway, it's a good movie to watch, but it, that's where the term originated from. Um, so with all that, what we're dealing with is if you get enough of the same conversation occurring consistently, it'll start to make you question your own experiences and reality. And if you think, well, I tuned into this television show and I was told this, but man, it really doesn't feel like it. You tune into another one and they're saying the same thing, like Project Mockingbird. It helps facilitate um, the narrative further along because everywhere you turn, you hear the same story. Oh, that's a narcissist freaking wet dream. I've got complete control. It's no matter where you go. And then anytime you get somebody to offer you a sense of reality checks where you do get an honest or an understandable reality that somebody else sees something happening negative to you and or they see the event was different that actually seems to be closer to the truth or being the real truth, it makes you question that person versus the one that's telling you the alternate reality. So the media is doing that very well right now. And that includes social media with all the censorship uh, where they put little disclaimers to make the, whoever put the post out look more discredited because the fact checkers said that it's not right or that there's some, uh, something wrong with the data. So it reduces the credibility of the individual that posted it because they're now posting something that is not 100% accurate. Even if it is accurate, all they have to say is it's not true. Um, so there is an interesting rise to a counter effect to this, which is, uh, Portland has surpassed in percentage is the number one in this country murder rate increase percentage wise is the highest percentage growth of murder, uh, since, uh, I believe it's the beginning of this year. So how the conservative news sources managed to get the fact checkers to actually admit that it's as high as it is, is they exaggerated it and, and doubled it. So they said uh, the conservative uh, uh, news source or uh, reporting source said that it was 1600%. And the fact checkers went back and said, that's not true. Uh, this is false information. It's only 856% of an increase in, uh, in murder. So it, it actually made the fact checkers kind of out themselves because they used an, exa an exaggerated number and then fact checkers actually made it, they brought out the truth. So it's, it's an interesting little shift in how conservatives and or people like myself, non-party affiliates or like Joshua, uh, have started to learn how to get them to actually admit truth. So, um, yeah, I, again, I, to, to risk further tangent, just know that when they say gaslighting and like Joshua said, gaslighting has become more of a reality or becoming a, something that's like happening to all of us. I, it, in my opinion, it is as well. Uh, you can't turn anywhere and not have somebody telling you that you're wrong and here's why you're wrong. And then you're provided this pseudo truth or pseudo science piece, you know, like all of this stuff going on with the coof, you know, people are going out and getting the old, you know, stickeroo, the jab, you know, and there's less than a 1% chance that something bad's going to happen to you if you don't you know. So there's a lot that's going on that I think is um, worthy of looking into. You know, but just hold hold sanity. Know that you're not alone. If you do feel like you are being, you know, um, if you do feel like you're being like gaslit, uh, find somebody else who's, you know, what you would consider rational. Uh, not be careful though, the person's gaslighting, you might actually seem like they're rational. <laughs> but 
go to the ones you've trusted for a really long time and see where they are with it. If you feel like you're being isolated, there's a pretty good chance somebody in your life is doing it. Whoever's making you feel like you're getting close to them and nobody else around them. Um, that's a symptom. You have to learn the symptoms of it in order to identify it. Heck so. yeah. And once you're aware, Chad, I highly recommend you doing some research on gaslighting because this, this is not just pertaining to media and news consumption. You're, I, the more I've looked into it, the more I've seen people in my inner circle who actually do it to myself and others. So gaslighting is a very, very manipulative tool. And once you're aware that someone's doing it and you're aware of what it is, your whole world, your eyes just could be open to like, dang, like what's, what's real? What's, am I being manipulated this way? It, it, it's crazy. So I, I highly recommend looking into it and, and just protecting your inner circle, protecting uh, where you get your information from and just, just being aware. You know, the show is called Waking the People for a reason. That doesn't just pertain to uh, the news or we talk about crypto a lot. It, it can be from a life perspective as well. So uh, just be awake, be aware and just, you know, keep your chin up, you know, or down depending on the situation. Yeah. Yes. All right. I, unfortunately, we're going to have to close the show a little bit earlier than anticipated. I do want to touch on one more subject before we go. Um, I've actually, my neighbor just asked me if I, um, he, he suspects that there was a gunshot neighbor in the neighborhood. So ask me if I heard it. So I've got me a little bit because my dog's outside playing around in the yard. Um, so with that. Well, if you want, I'll carry it on. Just go check on me. Yeah, I, I'm probably going to have to do a little bit more investigating. But yeah, I'll check on her at least anyway. So you guys give me a second here. Uh, Joshua, go ahead and continue on. And I'll at least make sure she's good. Absolutely. Yeah, it's that's crazy. Uh, that stuff is becoming pretty predominant and and especially depending on where you live the 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 amount of violence increase in our country has been pretty substantial for the last so all months and, and i i think that pertains to a lot of situations that we are we're going through i i had a conversation with um a friend of mine earlier uh, and, and we talked about how the generation that's growing up now uh, i'm a millennial and now I'm no longer the, the, the young cat in town. Now we have Generation Z. And to, to grow up and be a Gen Z in this environment with all the things that have happened and all the stress that we've had to go through just because of all this bullshit that's hit the fan, it's amazing and it's crazy. And everyone, I don't care who you are, I feel like everyone has had some kind of impact in their life that the last year and a half has caused so whether that be financial in your family life just in your stress life it's important to keep track of that and it's important to manage your stress the best you can so for those who don't know i'm predominantly in um, uh, the i would say uh, physical exercise realm, uh, the mind control, not mind control, but uh, just stress in general, whether it be from a physiological standpoint or a psych uh, psychological standpoint. And you got to make sure that you take time out of your day uh, for yourself. This may sound kind of like a weird, you know, montage into what I was talking about before, but just, just due to the overall stress that we've had to uh, endure throughout this last year and a half. It's important that you take breaks, whether that be for meditation. Uh, there's a there's a, a little show on Netflix that I've been watching a lot, and it's called um, Headspace Guide to Meditation. It's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, make sure you're exercising regularly. There's so many very easy steps you can take in your life to both manage stress, to both manage your uh, your possibility of risk of, of disease or you know. Uh, premature death, I guess you could say, but th there's so many things to do and don't let the stress of this year and a half impact you to a standpoint to where you can't make the necessary uh, action to prevent you from, from getting too much stress. Yeah, that would be, uh, actually, there's a lot that we could say when it comes to really getting into the health effects of stress 
and how to actually reduce it and increase your your well-being, your vitality. Both of us actually have spent a lot of time in the fitness industry. Uh, myself, I've spent a lot of time in the physical therapy office, corrective exercise specialist, as well as holistic education through the Czech Institute. So I got a lot of study in that as well. So we could have a conversation like that in the near future. But when it comes to meditating and clearing your mind, it is a great process and a practice. Um, you may want to look into the show that Joshua was talking about. My suggestion also would be keep a journal so that you can track your thoughts and to find out which one of those thoughts are, you know, kind of lingering or consistent and then try to find its root as best as possible so that you can kind of get into completion of those things that are bothering you versus just kind of letting them linger as if you're able to manage them even whenever you're distracted. It's not very effective like that. So, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. And once you do it, like once you get into it a little bit, Chad, and not just from a physiological standpoint, which is, I think, a, the, the uh, from a, just a, a physiological betterment of yourself is going to lead to a psychological betterment eventually. Um, actually, I was listening to Jordan Peterson a little bit earlier today, and he talked about how uh, all the, you know, not meditation, but just other psychological tools that you use to to better your cognitive ability. Actually, I've never really been shown to work, but there's been several studies on uh, just physical exercise that has shown to lead to cognitive improvement. So got to stay physically active, Chad. Yeah, no, it's actually, uh, Paul Check has a book called, um, is it Dr. O, which goes over uh, multiple different, like, or no, your four doctors. Uh, Dr. O is one of those. There's multiple doctors that are in this. And all it is, is about like self-care doctors, if you will, not the people you go to see that are physicians about your own personal responsibility by taking care of yourself and treat yourself as if you are your best patient. So, but a lot of good stuff and, and self-care is extremely important, especially at a time like this, when the majority of us are already living at a stress level that's significantly higher than it was prior to the pandemic. So, um, yeah. No, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about, uh, not to jump subjects too quick, but this is, uh, again, this is something that for the viewers, if you like that type of conversation, uh, we absolutely can explore that more when we have it a little more planned out. Um, we absolutely can have all kinds of lifestyle conversations that have to do with health and well-being and how to build good habits and lose weight, build muscle in a sustainable way. Uh, depths of information when it comes to nutrition, supplementation, you know, actually good exercises, what kind of exercises should you be doing? You know, there's so many things that we could actually get into, but we do, we should plan that a little bit more, get viewer feedback and find out exactly which subjects you all really want us to talk about. Because between Joshua and I, we could talk all day about fitness and you may find it really interesting, but you may not get a lot of takeaways you can do today. So do interact with us at, um, is it uh, waking the people podcast at gmail.com as well as comment on the comment section on our YouTube and or rumble sec uh, channels. Uh, yeah. Just one second here and I'll finish with this. No, you're good. And even just leave it in the, for all of our Facebook uh, paper hands viewers who need to come over to the channel. Uh, you just leave it in the Facebook comments as well. So yeah, it's Chad and I have had an extensive amount of experience in the fitness industry, and that would actually be an epic episode. But I want to hear some feedback and I want to hear some questions because I think a lot of people out there, I, I know a lot of people out there are, are not doing what they really need to do as far as from a physical fitness standpoint. And Chad and I could really, really articulate it and break it down for you to where it could have massive uh, impacts in your life. So I, that would be good epic episode but i want to hear some feedback i just don't want to do it you know what i mean chad i gotta hold that carrot in front of you i want to i want yeah. to hear what you got to say and i'll you gotta bring that you gotta bring it baby we'll come get you an hour, an hour episode of that so i want to see some oh. feedback on it yeah all right last uh, subject for this episode all right this one's going to be about pace and this is it actually is so what is PACE, Chad? Is PACE an acronym for something? 
It is. So what PACE stands for is it's a, so the last three years is more than 4,000 Tampa Bay homeowners finance projects through property assisted clean energy programs, which stands for PACE. So uh, again, it's property assisted clean energy. Now it'll be known as PACE. When you guys see this stuff on your social media, um, television, wherever you, radio, whatever, wherever you hear about this, where the government has a program that can get you solar for free. Be careful. They may be offering a PACE program. Now, PACE programs are not all evil. The issue with the PACE program is, again, it's, it's a system used in order to get people financing so that they can get things like, you know, solar on their, or solar for their home and or air conditioning uh, units replace stuff like that. So, but it's a property assisted clean energy. The reason why it's important to understand this is how you actually have to pay for it. It is not free. It, if you get any kind of government rebates or discounts or tax credits or anything, it does not cover the entirety of the product. What they do with this is, again, it's a property assisted clean energy. Josh, what does that sound like to you from just hearing property assisted clean energy? Property assisted clean energy. So the government is giving what a, a property energy agreement it sounds like they, they they're, they're somehow trying to say the property is theirs am i wrong on that uh, no you're yeah you're you're not quite there um but you're focusing in the right area okay there's definitely some some side action going on that's yeah right. the way this works is say you sign up for a pace program now now the people that come out they're not likely going to tell you it's a pace program you would get it in the contract and find out that it's there most likely so what it is is it is you don't pay anything today they will likely minimize it because it's not the government doing this there's companies that service this so they'll come out they'll talk to you about your options you can get into solar for no money today. You know, you get your air conditioner replaced if you don't have the money to do it right now. And what they do is they, whatever you agree to is the terms, which typically for most people, especially with the article that I have here, which is the Tampa Bay Times, um, most of the individuals in this article, actually none of the individuals in this article actually understood how they were going to pay for it. Now, some of them were under the belief that they were just going to get a bill at the end of the year, and they were suggested to hold back about $100 a month at the end of the year, they'd be able to pay for it. Now, the reality is what they do is they put a lien on your property. Ooh. So it's homeowner only. You have to be in good standing on your taxes for the last four years. If you have any delinquencies in your taxes for the last four years, you're not eligible. Unfortunately, there's not as much oversight with this particular program. The problem with that is, let's say if you've had a tax issue in the last four years, predominantly the people that have a tax issue are likely going to be the ones that actually have a home that's paid off, no mortgage. So they would be paying their taxes annually or they'd pay it monthly uh, or however they would actually have it paid. So what they do is, let's say I signed up in February with this particular type of program. I would sign up, I wouldn't pay any money today. The installers would come, they'd take care of everything. Uh, you have three days by law to back out of this program, by the way. You have three days by law to back out of, I think almost every contract, if not all contracts. Um, <clears throat> so, but there's a Florida, uh, it's a buyer's remorse clause. It's a three day window, it's three business days. So what, do they install it before Chad? They, they well, they won't. They won't likely install it before the three days is up. They wait for the three days so they've got you on. Oh, uh, so what they'll do, they'll come out, they'll install it, they'll take care of everything. But what they don't tell you is like on average uh, for a pretty decent sized house, about 1,250 square feet, I might be wrong on this somewhat, but I'm gonna be pretty damn close. May cost you about, a, uh, for a brand new air conditioning unit, about eight, uh, 8,500. They're charging 
on average, the majority of the people, actually the ones that reported what they paid for their air conditioning units once they went through all the fine uh, front, fine print and got their actual information about what they signed for, they paid over $12,000 for that air conditioning unit. Dang. It's a pretty decent markup. Now, what they do is also a lot of these people have liens against their property that are spread out over 30 years. So it may be a minuscule amount you're going to pay for the next 30 years. But the issue with that is your in, your um, the interest rates that you're going to be paying off of it or 30 years for and the sale price of the air conditioning unit in this example is going to be $12,000. Then you're going to have your interest built up for the next 30 years. You're going to pay significantly more than $12,000 than $12, for that air conditioning unit, which you really should have paid closer to about $8,500 for. So now they also do the same thing when it comes to the solar. Now, I'll grab some of the examples instead of reading the entire article, although it's an excellent article. So if you're interested in finding out more about this one in particular, look up the Tampa Bay Times and go under tax hit. Uh, solar panels on Ruskin homes purchased with PACE loans, Times 2019. And it actually shows some of the homes that did this. Sounds great because you're not going to pay anything out of pocket right away. Now, once the end of the year comes around, they reassess your property with the lien, and then you're going to pay the assessed value of your property plus the value of the lien against your property, and you'll be paying it back every month, all year long, or whenever you pay your property taxes, and you'll pay it all, and you'll continue to pay it for the duration unless you pay off early which most of these people are not aware of that. They also do seem to target people that are a bit more ignorant to it or a bit more credulous or trusting. So this one particular person, um, her name is Catherine. Uh, the air conditioner in her 672 square foot home died in the mid spring. Now this woman in particular does have MS. So she's not able to comfortably sit without air conditioning because the condition seems to be a bit more exaggerated or exacerbated not exaggerated, exacerbated from being uh, warm. So she sat for a while, got a little desperate, and then eventually was contacted or contacted these individuals. Her property tax for the year was $300. That's amazing for property taxes for a house. So it went to $1,200 a year. Now it's a $900 increase. Her original property taxes again were $300. That'll likely be spread out for 30 years. It depends on the term of the loan that they, she agreed to, although most of these people are unaware of what they're agreeing to. Now, this has gotten so bad, by the way, Joshua, that here the tax collector in Pasco County has said, I'll give you a comment from the company here in just a second. The attorney general has gotten involved with this. Uh, they're investigating a specific company. The specific one is the largest one in Florida. Uh, that's done a lot in Hillsborough County. Um, uh, California, here's an interesting piece, and I'll get back to Pasco County in just a second. Uh, PACE programs began in California in 2008 as a way to help more residents, including those with lower incomes, make their homes energy efficient. They later extended, or ex I'm sorry, ex I'm learning to read today. Uh, <laughs> they later expanded to upgrades that protect against natural disasters such as hurricane resistant windows. Many states have PACE programs for businesses, but Florida, California, and Missouri also allow homeowners to participate. Qualifying for a traditional mortgage or car loan typically hinges on someone's financial track record. The lender will look at credit scores, bank statements, income to ensure a borrower has the means to make monthly payments. In Florida, PACE loans have no such requirements. Homeowners qualify based off the quality and the equity, again, learning to read today, equity in their homes. They also must have paid property taxes on time for the previous three years. So it's three, not four, I, I stand corrected. There's, uh, there's another major difference. PACE loans are tax liens tied to the home, not the homeowner. So if I, sell, if I were to do this and then sell my home, the person that would take, uh, would buy my home would then be uh, responsible for the lien. Because again, it's against the property, not against the individual. So homeowners pay their uh, PACE loans through their annual property tax bill. While the programs are outlined in state law, they're run by third parties. Three firms have dominated the state residence, uh, residential PACE programs. Those are, 
It looks like it's Y-G-R-E-N-E. -E. And I think that's just an interesting way of spelling green. Um, green, I don't know. Renewable Financial Group and Counterpoint Energy Solutions. Counterpoint said it is no longer issuing residential PACE loans, but instead is focusing on commercial financing. The companies hire and vet contractors who pitch the program to perform the work. PACE has lower interest rates and longer terms result, uh, resulting in lower monthly payments that make it more affordable, said Lemire of Green, which passed $1 billion in Florida PACE projects this year. That's insane. Think about that. That's $1 billion in the PACE projects in this year. Sure uh -huh. Bitcoin. That okay. company is making stupid money. And the majority of the people, again, this article is written for a, a lot of people that actually weren't aware of what they were getting into. So there's one gentleman I wanted to bring up, then I'll get to the tech. Uh, the... Let, let me throw some commentary in there. I mean, it's like pretty much you're agreeing to essentially a second mortgage on your home at a higher interest rate. And these people have no clue. What a shady company. Like, you know yeah. that most of these people that sign up for this have no idea. No one in their right mind would ever sign over essentially a lien on their home. Like, nobody. And they're just running around collecting all this money and just trapping people. It's funny how yeah. it started in California. Yeah, it's, it's predatory in my opinion. But then again, it's my opinion. Uh, but I would be very safeguarded. So here's a little bit more about the woman that I mentioned with MS. <clears throat> Uh, her husband died in 2004. She retired uh, from part-time work uh, in a medical office in 2014. Social Security disability benefits is, and $350 a month from her roommate barely covered the bills. A PACE loan felt like her only solution. The air conditioning salesman said, uh, she said, told her the program wouldn't cost anything up front. She would put $70 a month aside to help pay for the increase in her annual taxes. He said the application could be approved that day. <clears throat> it was made to seem like it was a real new thing that just come, uh, this just came from California, Mia said. <clears throat> now there's another gentleman. This is another interesting one, by the way. So uh, this gentleman, I'm just going to call him Jeffrey, although his full name is on the article. Uh, he's 46. He recounted the similar sales pitch when the air conditioner had, uh, at his Pasco home broke in June, 2017. The Pace loan, uh, his air conditioning salesman said would come with no interest and the first payment wouldn't be due for a year. <clears throat> so Jeffrey also would get a tax break for installing an energy efficient appliance. He remembers the salesman saying the new air conditioner cost about $14,000. He'd only need to set aside hundred dollars a month. He was told all he had to do was sign the tablet. But after about a year, when his property tax bill came in or came due, his mortgage company told him he would need nearly twice as much to cover the loan. He also discovered that the loan wasn't zero interest. It was at 7.69%. He didn't get a tax break for installing the air conditioner either. <clears throat> the program seemed to come with many benefits, he said. Then it turns out that the pretty much as far from the truth as you could get. Now, <clears throat> There's another one in here that's really interesting. And then the Pasco County tax collector found 15 homeowners who got PACE loans despite recent tax delinquencies, including maize. Oh, you're not supposed to get in if you have tax delinquencies within three years. Oh, and there's 15 other ones that they found in an audit. Mike, uh, that is Fesano, which is the tax collector for Pasco was uh, dismayed with how the companies ignored the requirement that he said he would no longer collect money from those loans. The homeowners would have to make any more or wouldn't have to make any more payments, uh, Fesano said, unless the pace companies push back. <clears throat> now, here's the one that I really wanted to point out. So <clears throat> a salesman told Charles, uh, I'm not going to say his last name, Charles, that a PACE loan would solve his problems. His 35-year-old Brandon home had leaky windows and doors. Hanover, or I'm sorry, uh, Charles, 68, discovered later that he had taken out two loans 
Not one. He said wasn't even or wasn't told the amount for either loan or the interest rates. A little over six months later, he found out that his property taxes would raise from $900 a year to more than $6,250, a sevenfold increase. Public records show that his loans total more than the estimated $45,000, about 26% of his home's value. The Times identified 40 homeowners in Hillsborough County who had two or more loans, uh, PACE loans on a single property. So they can stack these. Now, who that's, regulates this shit? A, that's Man? the problem. It's not well regulated. So, and most of it, like the tax collectors, they don't even know what's happened until they reassess the property at the end of the year when they send out the new tax, uh, the new tax bill. That's when they, they can find out, but even then they have to look for it. Uh, they just see that there's a different tax value. So yeah, it's, it's insane. Oh, uh, so when you see that stuff, again, it's the old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not good. It's probably not true. Now, I wanted to bring this up because I've seen a lot of these advertises, uh, advertisements that are on the rise. You know, summer's coming around. This is another borderline gold rush. The, the one company by itself sold a billion dollars worth of uh, products through PACE. So, so some of the PACE programs. So what happens is if you can't pay your property taxes, your property taxes go delinquent. If they're delinquent for two years, your house could be sold. So you got to be careful with this stuff. It depends on the county you're in uh, and possibly the state you're in, how long you have to pay back taxes. So be careful with this stuff out there, people. Now, there are some people that believe they're doing a good thing and they may not understand the full depth of the business, but there's other people that are involved in it that fully understand they get paid very well. Now, that kind of business, I guarantee you, they get paid very well for what they do. So if something like that happens, not a lot of people have the ability, the credit or the income stream or whatever credit worthiness to be able to go into getting um, you know, these, uh, you know, like if their air conditioner goes out or, you know, whatever they need to get that the PACE uh, program covers, they may be in a desperate state. I'm not saying don't do it. I am saying, look at the fine print. I'm saying, look at everything you can get. Don't just sign it and just hope or pray that the person's doing you a favor. Be careful with this stuff. Now, so that's one of them. I've got a couple other great subjects, not for today, but to keep in mind moving forward. Um, I'm going to be covering something that I've been researching. So look for future episodes on uh, the gentleman that made Supersize Me and Supersize Me Too. Um, I'm also going to be covering more on the EV car market or the, the electric vehicle market. Yeah, covering more on that. And um, um, obviously, as I go over and get more information and data on the PACE programs, um, if you're curious about those, by all means, do comment on the comment section and or send, a, uh, send us over an email. Uh, if you like what we do and you want to contribute to what we do and help us upgrade the studio, get Joshua and I in the same place, by all means, reach us on our Gmail account and we will uh, we'll discuss how to actually support the show. So otherwise, I mean, if you're not in the position to support that way, by all means, also share the video, you know, get your friends to watch. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed hit that like button take that bad boy on a little tinder date and then pound pound that son of a bitch oh uh, and uh, yeah i i've got nothing else for today's show uh the next one will be we're actually going to be doing the recording on sunday so we'll publish later on sunday uh but this one will be published uh friday yeah we'll we'll publish friday evening so uh joshua you got anything else for us um, yeah, I mean, just a great show. Eventually, we're going to start a Patreon. We just have to figure out how to do it. Chad and I schedule are super busy. Uh, this show is something that's very important to us. So we make sure that we take at least two days out of the week to really put forth a, a, as, as good as a product as we can, just based on the sole love for what it is. So, again, hit that subscribe button. We're trying to get to 70. We don't have much time left. Next week, we got Logan Paul versus Floyd Mayweather. So we're going to throw some of that in there. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's going to be a great week. 
again, stay golden, pony boy, just, just <laughs> do the thing, and uh, we'll, we'll see you in a few days. Yeah, remember everyone, we're in this together. I'm looking forward to that Mayweather and, and, and Logan Paul. Now, I want to see them being in it together. <laughs> and uh, you know what? We should do a watch party for that. That would be fun. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, remember, we're in this together. We're Americans. Let's act like it. You know, there's nothing wrong with being American proud. Uh, let's bring it back. Uh, with that, we'll catch you all on the flip side. And uh, as Joshua says, stay golden, pony boy. <laughs> <laughs>